In this discussion, I'd like to cover a topic that some of you have raised, uh, both publicly on the comment section underneath one of the last videos that I released, which was uh, the last episode so far of Xu Xiaodong's uh, interview series. And some of you have discussed this with me in private, so I thought maybe it's a good, it's a good uh, topic to, to broach and to touch on here um, and expand upon. I have also done other interviews in the past uh, both publicly and domestically here in China and for international outlets that kind of touched on this topic as well. Um, one of the interesting concepts uh, that was raised by one of, one of you Patreon uh, supporters was that um, uh, after looking at the last episode of Xu Xiaodong, the question was raised, are there any traditional masters that can beat MMA? And this is quite an interesting insight into the mentality of how a lot of people are kind of seeing the situation, particularly with Xu Xiaodong, and the reality, and then also a disconnection from the reality of the situation. So I thought maybe we'd discuss a couple of key points here. The first thing is that I know Xu Xiaodong, as you've seen in those videos, for years before he actually had that initial fight with Wei Lei. Um, I mentioned why I knew him uh, and how I knew him. And at the same time, I saw that whole thing unfold. So I kind of had a little bit of um, first-hand uh, insight into what was going on. I also saw it from the public point of view here, and then from the professional point of view, the reaction and the words, and then the international point of view. And everybody has their opinion, of course, left and right, some being valid, some being not so valid. And the reason why some opinions are not valid is because, unfortunately, there's a lot of information that people don't know um, and they're coming to a conclusion even, even though they have, no, they have an opinion on it and a very strong opinion even though they don't know the actual facts of the situation. And this occurred on both sides, both the supporters and the haters, etc. Uh, for me personally, I think a topic is always much more nuanced. So I don't like to say uh, it's 100% black or 100% white. But I can explain certain things that I saw. And that was the, the purpose of me going after Xu Xiaodong just to to interview him and to get a lot of the misconceptions and the facts of the matter out in the open. Now that is in no sense a, a stamp of approval by me on all of his actions. I've said this multiple times. I think he handled certain things in the wrong way. I think he reacted viscerally and emotionally in ways that he shouldn't have in terms of the things he said and, uh, and the things that he, he, he may have publicly announced. Uh, and I think he could have handled certain things in a better way, which would have made him look better. And it would have also looked better for the situation at hand, because there's a couple of things that need to be understood. The first thing is that this was not an issue with regards to traditional Chinese martial arts as a whole. This was a specific issue with certain individuals that he had come across. And we've seen many of them, and it's not just in traditional Chinese martial arts, it's, a, it's an aspect that we've seen it in all martial arts. Unfortunately, traditional martial arts, whether they be Japanese, Indonesian, whatever they are, Chinese, seem to be a situation where you have more of these types of people emerge, and these types of people are people that make false claims, mislead the public, and misrepresent the reality of both their arts and their abilities. And that is, in fact, what... Uh, what Xu Xiaodong actually initially encountered. You can watch the interview, so I'm not going to get into that. But that is something you should at least always keep in mind when you're trying to evaluate the situation and what's going on. So that being said, a lot of the time people will say, oh, but why isn't he going out and fighting real fighters? Why is he not going out and fighting professional fighters? Why is he fighting these people if he wants to prove himself? Well, he doesn't want to prove himself. That's not what this is about. He's trying to make them, he's asking them to prove themselves. In most cases, it's them trying to say to him that they will prove themselves on him. Um, so that's a bit of a strange, uh, strange suggestion for him to go out and fight a professional fighter. Xu Xiaodong is uh, about a year older than me. I'm not young anymore either. It's not as if I can go out and do uh, professional combat uh, sports myself. I'm way past that age group. Okay, there's a few outliers that, that are able to, but we're not in that age group anymore. So he's not going to go out and start fighting professional fighters. He was a professional Sunday athlete. He competed way back when. Again, you can watch the interviews. There's a bit of history there. Uh, if you want to watch a couple of the old podcast episodes, I in fact interviewed the guy who, who first armbarred uh, Xu Xiaodong when he was a Sunday athlete. 
and introduced him to grappling. Uh, Andy P. Andy P. actually um, even mentions in the in the interview, which a lot of people don't know, that Xu Xiaodong kicked him so hard that his arm broke. Andy had to have a pin put his arm, through his arm after that fight, but he still finished the fight. So if you want to hear a little bit about that situation and his past, that's it. But nowadays he's retired, so for him to go out and fight a professional fighter, it's a bit of a misnomer because he's not trying to prove himself. He's just trying to say, well, you say you've got this ability, so let's see if it works, right? And I think that's actually a good thing for all martial arts as a whole. We should be honest. If martial arts is about anything, it's about honesty. You cannot develop any traditional Chinese martial art, whether you're doing Xing Yi Quan, Ba Gua Zhang, or whatever your, your practice is, without coming from a point of honesty. And that first point of honesty has to be with yourself. Um, and this is something that is inherent in the martial ethics of practicing Chinese martial arts. It's honesty to yourself, being honest about what you're doing, how you're training, your efforts, your levels, your problems that you need to work on, your pluses and your minuses, your strengths and your weaknesses. If you're not honest, you're not going to get anywhere. And in fact, most traditional teachers will notice these types of character flaws and you probably won't even be kept on as a student or taught with a deep heart that they would teach somebody of a different moral character. So we already have a problem if people are coming out of the, the martial arts community and they have these inherent moral problems like honesty. So this is the first thing that uh, we need to identify here. These people are being dishonest and we need to, it's not about black or white, traditional versus sport, etc. First and foremost, we should be able to say, was somebody being honest or were they being dishonest? And if they're being dishonest, that's not a representation of the art, nor should you think it's a representation of your art. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, Xu Xiaodong is fighting them, and you could consider them amateurs in, in the sense that they're not professional fighters. Well, Xu Xiaodong is an amateur at this point too. He's retired. But here's the interesting point, and it's not, again, if... Now, let's leave Xu Xiaodong out of this scenario right now. If it had been any other retired professional fighter fighting against an elder or an older lifelong Chinese martial art practitioner, um, you know, there are some things that you need to keep in mind. Um, a retired Formula One driver is not going to lose, in most cases, to you or I that drive on a daily basis in a civil amateur society that we're using it as part of our methods to get around in daily life. Even if you have a professional race car driver who has retired for a long time and you decide to have a road race with him, chances are he's still going to have the ability to handedly beat you in a race. And that's because he has developed these standard and skills over a long period of time. So we're not talking about differences in, in what you're doing. Uh, you're driving a car, but there's a difference in what standard you took it to, what level you took it to, and what you focused on. Now, a lot of the, the skills and abilities that a professional race car driver develops has zero function in your day-to-day -day life driving on the street. In fact, some of the habits might even get you into trouble on a day-to-day -day driving uh, situation in the street. And there, once again, we evaluate and we identify another part of this problem and the question. You need to understand what the arts were created for, in what environment they were created for, and also what their content is as a whole today. So that's the second part. Another example would be most people can swim. Most of us know how to swim. We can float. We won't drown if we're in the water. We can move in the water. We're able to enjoy ourselves on a day-to-day -day life and use the ability of swimming uh, with no problem. But against a professional swimmer who's doing the same thing, it's just another standard. It's not as if he's inventing a new stroke um, or a new, a totally different way to swim. We're talking about apples to apples here. You're talking about a different standard. And if a professional swimmer beats an amateur, there's not going to be an outcry of people from the amateur swimming community to say, well, I guess our swimming's all fake because you couldn't beat a professional. No, this is a, you're, you're, not, you're not comparing two people of the same standard to one another anymore. And this is, again, what we need to look at here. If you're expecting 
people that are doing traditional Chinese martial arts or any martial art to go out and handedly defeat a professional fighter, it's not realistic to think about that. And it's not because they are better or worse in terms of their art itself. It's that the standards are different. So that's the first thing that people should, uh, should definitely keep in mind when you're looking at these two things. And to expect a different outcome is not realistic. So with Shu even being retired, he has the muscle memory and the experience. He was still coaching for many years. For him to fight an uh, amateur, it's not really a tough feat. And on top of this, these amateurs are, for all intents and purposes, not representing their true abilities, as we spoke about the honesty situation. A lot of them are uh, what we'd call somewhat fraudulent. It's gonna, of course, the outcome is gonna be what it is. So you shouldn't look at this as a black mark on the traditional arts. So now let's get into what the traditional arts are. The traditional Chinese martial arts, like most world or even Asian, let's look at Asia as a whole, uh, martial art, traditional martial art, they come out of a, an environment that they were developed in through necessity. Their content is usually vast. They're not single focus. So you'll see in Xingyi and Bagua, there are aspects of striking, there are aspects of seizing, there are aspects of controlling, there are aspects of throwing and takedown. There will be knees, fists, elbows, punches, kicks, headbutts, weaponry, etc., etc., all included. And that is because of the environment that they developed in. Yes, they grew into other, other aspects in terms of lifestyle, lifestyle systems and incorporated other points. But as a whole, they were incorporating many aspects because of the environment where they grew from, the society, societal norms there, the, what you need to, uh, to be used in that society. And today's society is different. When we look at things like professional fighters, or whether they be boxers, whether they be Thai boxers, whether they be MMA, we're looking at a set of skills that is focused. MMA is one of the first formats that is a little bit more open. So you've got standing, you've got uh, taking down, grappling, controlling, locking, seizing, uh, punching, kicking, etc., etc., etc. For the most part, it's the more free in terms of all-inclusive, but it is still restrained. It's just restrained in certain aspects. It's restrained in what you wear. It's restrained in the rules that constantly evolve. But these combat sports, for example, boxing, for example, judo, they are focusing on a certain thing. And people that become professional in that focus on those skills alone. So a professional boxer is not going to train kicks. That's just, there's no point for him to train kicks. So the time that you're, he's using is totally focused on one aspect of combat, his handwork to use within the rule set of boxing. Um, that gives him the ability to focus and to develop that single skill to a very high level. So going into his field to fight would leave you at a disadvantage because you wouldn't have focused on all of those skills if you just went in as a traditional martial artist. He's used to the format. He's got the skills to a high level within that format. And you've been focusing on a multitude of things, not focusing on that format and those skills alone. So you're already at a disadvantage. For you to prepare to go into that kind of a environment, you would have to now focus on that format and the skills that are allowed in that format, thereby negating everything else that you have in your system that you, you would generally practice. There is no point in training multitudes of weapons, uh, kicking techniques and, and throwing techniques if you're going to enter a boxing match. You'd say, all right, well, let me go into my system and let me pull out the things that are useful in that single environment. And what you will find is that maybe there are certain skills within your traditional art that are useful in boxing, but you're going to find that because the boxer in today's uh, environment has become such a refined focused thing, they'll have a lot more tools than you will because simply because of the corpus of the traditional art has to include many other aspects. It's not taking into consideration you're only going to do that. So you will find that there's a lot that you can use there and you can focus and develop on that. And you can enter and you probably can do well if you focus and train and, and, and prepare in a certain way. Most likely you will have to adapt other skills that are suitable to that that are not re, uh, existent in your style. Does that mean that you're still doing the traditional style? 
Does that mean that you're doing boxing? That's for you to decide. At the end of the day, Chinese martial arts and traditional martial arts are supposed to be something that you can apply to any aspect in your life. It's not only an aspect that you apply in terms of direct combat or conflict. You should be learning many other skills through your practice. Um, and that's for you to decide if you find that you want to develop and practice the arts as a whole, or do you want to go become a combat athlete? Because if you want to be a combat athlete at a professional level, you have to do that all the time. So what I'm getting at here is that, and I'll use myself as an example as well, I started, I started going into grappling and wrestling gyms simply because I wanted another avenue to try and to use my traditional skills that I had developed in Xingyi and Bagua on people outside of my environment and also to be exposed to their methods and see my skills, how they would rack up and to feel, uh, to feel where, where things are different. You're used to, if you're used to only training with us uh, within a specific style, you don't get exposed to something else that might be uh, used against you. And this is actually the way you should have a mindset of being open to test yourself if you are that way inclined. Not everybody wants to do that. I did that and I found that the skills, the basic abilities that I had, my skills, and you, they were very useful. In fact, it was surprising to a lot of the people when I first started doing that, that I hadn't trained in their arts, but I was able to at times beat them. I mean, even within the first period of me training there. Uh, so, so this is testament that these arts work. Um, I used to compete as well when I was much younger in certain combat, particularly Chinese martial arts, because I, I came out of an environment that I always uh, believed that if you martial arts, you should be able to use it. And I was young enough to be able to, to test myself. I would enter Chinese martial arts uh, combat uh, events as well as doing forms. Uh, and so that was always my mindset. And in subsequent years, I've still entered, uh, even last year I entered a professional, semi-professional uh, uh, combat event which was focused on grappling. And honestly, I was one of the oldest guys there, so old that I had to enter an age group below me. There was nobody in my, of my age and even those young guys had difficulty, major difficulty with me. And I had to prepare, etc., etc., etc. And for me, there's no conflict here. The skills that I've developed in Chinese martial arts are totally applicable to there. But I, you have to be, as I've, I hope this has somewhat given you insight, you have to have the correct perspective on what you're doing, who you're fighting with, what the format is, what the arts are, etc. So you don't have this black and white idea. If a traditional master is going and losing to an MMA fighter, then the MMA is better than the tradition. Well, um, what are you comparing here? This guy is a professional, that's his standard, that's all he does. This guy is, a, is an amateur who's trained the art in terms of just in his daily life. Of course, you're not even comparing the same standard. The only way you might be able to compare these two things is, is if they had trained to the same standard. And then, of course, you have the whole format and focus aspect. Chinese martial arts, for me, has, has quite a few uh, values and I've used this analogy before it's like the five fingers kind of on a hand right the thumb which makes your hand basically functional is the combat and the functional use the techniques have to have functional use and yes all the techniques in Xing Yichuan and Ba Guajiang have functional use they have functional use and if they don't have functional use and they don't develop some aspect of functional use for martial art then something's wrong with the technique for the most part all right so that is the core of these arts, but that's not all. We have cultural uh, aspects that are, are important and traditional aspects that are important to practice. So the value for me in Chinese martial arts is that I'm learning tradition and culture, which I find valuable. How is it valuable? It adds value and meaning and interest in my life. It gives me insight into culture and philosophies and, and things that, that rich make my life rich and meaningful. There are aspects there that I apply to other aspects in my life that have helped me in many, many ways outside of simple combat. So you're getting that too. There's, of course, the entertainment point of view. It's, it's something that I like to do. Martial arts practice should be enjoyable. And that's the other aspect when I mentioned about check your goals out. Because if your goals are 
are simply to fight in a combat event. Well, if, they, if you enjoy that, I mean, by all means, do it. But if you're doing it and it seems like a chore or you're not actually in a better mental state for it, maybe you should reevaluate that. For me, Chinese martial arts has always given me something to enjoy doing. Um, so that's the other aspect. And of course, within that aspect of enjoyment, you also have the connection of community, the people that you train with. Uh, your martial brothers, your uncles, the family that you train within. There's value to that connection in the community. Finally, the, not finally, the next point you have is the health building. Chinese martial arts should make you healthy. It's a form of exercise, so any form of exercise is going to have its health benefits. Uh, it makes your body slightly stronger, of course, depending on the level to which you're training. If you're training a lot, you're going to get stronger. Uh, your cardiovascular system, your muscular system, all of these aspects are going to improve and develop. So it has health building. As opposed to doing no exercise, it has this. The other aspects with regards to overall health, I'll give you an example. I have an annual medical checkup here and uh, even up until now my resting heart rate when they check my resting heart rate okay given I do train quite a lot in terms of in general but my resting heart rate was at 42 beats a minute and it's been like that ever since I was even an athlete before so Marsh, Chinese martial arts has maintained that it's given me and, and my overall health is not that of my age I mean that, that's that's one of the things that the the, the reports always come back and, uh, and I'm happy for that and I attest that to my martial arts training, my Chinese martial arts training. We've spoken again about Neigong before, how you, you're supposed to combine intent, breath and movement. There is, an, there is a profound impact, uh, of course science would have to do deeper research on this if they're possible to do it, uh, between how this mental mind and motion breathing connection affects your cardiovascular and your central nervous system. I know for my for myself how this is, has, has improved. So you've got the health benefits to it. And finally you've got the spirit building, the spiritual aspects. This is not a woo-woo religious point of view. This is purely a, a character building, a, a mentality building endeavor, how it reinforces and builds your spirit. I'm not saying that professional sports don't do that. They definitely can too. But for me, Chinese martial arts as a whole has to have all of this. And if it doesn't have all of those, or if it's missing one or two parts of this, um, then it's not, you're not doing the art in full and it's not complete. And this is the true value of it. And if it gives you this value in your life, if you're able to learn how to handle yourself to a degree, maybe you're not going to go into an octagon and beat a, a professional martial artist, but you're able to deal with co conflict that you'd most likely encounter in your daily life with regards to physical conflict and it has all these other be benefits to you then you're gaining something that is truly of value. The other beauty about Chinese martial arts particularly Xing Yi and Bagua for me is that it's something you can do forever. A professional athlete has a very small window of time that they can compete. I was an athlete. It's a very short period of time that you can compete in. Um, over and above that, you're not going to be doing that at a professional level anymore. Chinese martial arts is something you can do forever. And for me, I get the most joy when I see these 90-year-olds still practicing. Okay, they're not going to go and beat the, the snot out of a 40-year-old. And that again is where Xu Xiaodong comes in. Because when you have an old man pretending to have magic powers and then saying that he'll beat young fighters. Personally, I don't want to fight old men. But that is a form of delusion. But for me, the beauty is when you see such an old man and he's practicing. He's not only practicing every day, he's physically healthy, he's mentally healthy, his brain is alert and awake, and he's enjoying himself. A lot of people age in our Western societies because as we get older, we not only seclude old people, but we tell them to stop moving so much. And that is a surefire way to putting someone into the grave, the physical death and the mental death. So the social connection of training and the mental building of focusing on learning and practicing your arts and remembering them and feeling things and having a connection with your keeps your brain young. Uh, another aspect, again, I, I didn't touch on this, is we have all these weapons that we practice in Chinese martial arts. They have no physical function to a large degree as they did 200 years ago. There's no function in today's society 
uh, that you need to develop such deep level skills on these weapons. Why do we do it? Because A, we're sticking to a culture and a tradition that we enjoy to practice. B, it has other functions and benefits outside of the pure ut utilitarian function of the technique itself in terms of those aspects of your body and your mind. And C, it's entertaining. It's truly a joy to learn and, and, and practice these things. So for me, these arts are so much more than what people see or think they should be. If you're just looking at a superficial level and you're saying, is this style going to beat that one? Is this style going to beat that one? Well, again, check your goals, see what you want to do in your, in your daily life and your practice. Uh, maybe you want to reevaluate this, but for me and uh, through my arts that I practice and the way my teacher taught me as truly functional. So there is an importance there. there are, not all Chinese martial artists are the same. Not all teachers are of the same standard. So this is where we can get into the standard within Chinese martial arts. A lot of teachers actually don't know the function. And for me, if you've lost the function, you've lost half, not only half, more than half of the intent of the entire art. So I was taught in a way that I know the, 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 the function. I'm taught in line with them, both as a physical function and an applicable function. Um, and that's how I practice. So I hope that uh, I can instill some of this in you that are following on the, in the, in the program. I hope that the value and the functional use of the techniques starts to become more, more apparent to you and how they actually work. But I hope that it gives you all those other four fingers of value in your daily life and your lives in general um, you know, with regards to your practice. And you can see that there's, there's a, there is a joy to practicing these arts outside of simply looking at them in a one-dimensional way. So that's that. Again, I do believe that if some people were of that ilk and decided to do it, they could take uh, the content and the methods that are used in Chinese martial arts and enrich most combat uh, formats and possibly even do, you know, you'll see maybe in one or two generations, you'll see specialist fighters coming out and entering that and applying their art there. Um, it's doable, but somebody has to actually focus on doing it to that level to enter that environment. Um, there have been a few. I mean, there's a few, there's a few traditional Chinese martial artists that have entered Sanda here. My teacher taught a national, uh, this we're talking about 20 years ago, one of his students won the weight class of Sanda in the national championships here too. So it is something that can be done. Um, but again, it, it's not going to be done without focusing on preparing for that standard and that format. So it's a complicated subject. I hope this has given you some insight to it. And uh, yeah, uh, keep training.